So what, why is there so much division around the border regions then? And why was there so much conflict? I watched a documentary recently. There was a you know, lot of hostility between Ukrainians and Russian Ukrainians yeah. around the Donbass region. Like what was that division that was being stoked? Is it historical yeah. division? So uh, now we can get into Ukraine a little bit. Um, Ukraine proper, where you know it's pre uh, even 2014 invasion. It's going on for eight years. It's pre-2014 invasion borders in Ukraine, not counting Crimea, was always ethnically Ukrainian. Okay, it was always, uh, even uh, in the Donbass, it'd be like 56%, I think was the, was the last census that was ever done. It was never a below majority Russian. It is true though, that in the Donbass in that area, they had more trade with Russia. They were coal mining towns. They just had, you know, the Soviet Union, like you're always speaking Russian anyway. They didn't have really uh, a Ukrainian identity uh, the way that uh, Western Ukraine has. So uh, just to be clear, they are ethnically Ukrainian primarily in that region, but not by much. OK, so, you know, how, how these things came about. I mean, they came about post Maidan, which we can talk about as well, because Scott Horton thought that was all uh, started by Nazis and by uh, the CIA uh, post Maidan. The Donbass had You should two, probably explain what Maidan was. So Maidan was, was the Euromaidan yeah. yeah. revolution that happened in 2014. Uh, I was there. Many of my friends were there. Uh, it started in November of 2013. It moved into February of 2014 and eventually culminated in the a few things. It was the ousting of former President Yanukovych of Ukraine, who, where did he flee? Did he flee to Syria, Italy? Uh, New York. No, he now lives in a multi-million dollar penthouse in Moscow. Okay. So was this when they had the snipers up on the, yeah, yeah, the, heavenly, the yeah. heavenly hundred? Those were his people, right. his security services that shot them was the yeah. conclusion of that event. Um, and I was there. It was the most, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an investigative journalist or whatnot. I, uh, I just, you know, I have a humble podcast. I have friends in Ukraine, but I can tell you that being there, in uh it was in february of 2014 it was the most that i've ever felt i was close to a war front it was extremely uh it was extremely tense the whole, so what basically happened is like an occupy wall street mm -hmm. but it was occupy maidan maidan is the freedom square in ukraine uh that's it was basically occupied and it was a real thing okay about a million ukrainians came to maidan and all around ukraine during that time and why did they come because yanukovych reneged on one of the first agreements that would have helped for EU accession, moving towards the EU, which Ukraine, a country of 40 million people strong, not at all uh, a country of 40 million Nazis, a country of 40 million people strong, was ready to move towards the EU. They've been agitating for it. They wanted it. And so it was a revolution that actually started by students in November of 2013. I was there. Uh, many people were there. It was, it, was, it was an unbelievable thing. All right. Uh, Trying to think about how deep I want to go here on that issue. But basically, um, Maidan ended with the ousting of Yanukovych. The people got him out, which was a wonderful thing. It was actually the second time. The first time he was out was in the Orange Revolution in 20, 2004. Again, Scott Horton liked to just throw in there that it was all the responsibility of the CIA. Yeah, I was going to say, the CIA these people, plot. These people have no agency, right? They must just be dumb Ukrainians, all right? Because they have no agency. They can't think for themselves. They, they take absolutely no agency. It's all got to be the CIA. It's just remarkable to think that. Now, uh, I want to address one of the things. So Scott always uh, likes to bring up the Victoria Newland call, which was a leaked call that after the Maidan had occurred, there were, th there were four factions, actually. There was Klitschko, the former boxer, mm -hmm. uh, his faction. There was uh, Yatsenuk and there was uh, Timoshenko. She was uh, jailed, uh, you know, political prisoner, basically, under the current prior regime. She was her faction. Um, and then it was the Maidan. Maidan itself kind of became a faction. It was a live like part of what was going to happen next with the government because Yanukovych fled. He had the most corrupt mansion ever. This was like, uh, they turned it into a museum. It was insane. I mean, gold plated toilets, whatever. I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but it was just insane. The stuff that he stole, everything was insane. He also had a black book, by the way, which his party, the party of regions had, it had billions of dollars of bribes over his last uh, tenor, billions of dollars of bribes. Uh, Paul Manafort was in that book. Uh, many people were in that book. And uh, these, this, all right, 
this, these signatures were verified. Uh, they would even, the remarkable thing is this, this black book was signed by some of the party regions, which is his party, this Donbass region, all right, which was more corrupt, more Putin friendly, more favorable toward Ru Russia. They signed these, these bribes. Like, all right, I agree with you on this one. I'll take the money. It was, it had signatures of the people that were basically, you know, you know, how corruption works, right? Like everybody's got to be a part of it. If someone wants to get out, you can't get out because you're guilty too. That's how corruption works, right? So they actually had it on paper and the signatures were verified after the fact. This was found in his, uh, in his, uh, in his residence, his presidential residence. So anyway, uh, these were all the different factions. It was absolutely not a CIA coup or whatnot. And it was a, a phone call that was leaked, all right? Uh, Victoria Newland, who this woman, I mean, she's like the undersecretary of state, I think at the time, she was handing out cookies in Maidan, you know, in, in good US leadership style, not really uh, putting on a good, a good face for the US. Just, it's a, it's a bit cheeky going around handing out cookies during this like revolution. And, um, and yeah, and, and she, they were trying to say who they wanted to get into the new regime. And they said, they think it's Yatsenuk. She said, fuck the EU, all this. And it looked bad. It looked bad. But again, can you point to that as being that the CIA is something that was running this? Right, Yatsenuk wasn't even, he was the interim prime minister. Now he's out. Uh, and even before that, uh, this Yanukovych, this corrupt Yanukovych, who now lives not in Italy or Syria or wherever, he lives in Moscow, uh, is, there was like a $30 million penthouse he lived in, it's probably well down now at least uh, since in valuation. He was ousted twice, right? So in 2004, that Orange Re Revolution, which again, CIA plot, of course, uh, if you remember Team America, you remember, oh, yeah. um, you know, the puppet who's, uh, Yushchenko was his name, who beat him, came back because it was a rigged election. He had like the pockmarked face. He got poisoned. He got poisoned. Uh, of course, Russian influenced the uh, election there. And the Ukrainians threw him out then. They got back in because there was a lot of Russian influence in that Donbass region. And then the Ukrainians threw him out again in 2014. Look, is it perfect? Is it an ideal society? No, I absolutely not. I can't, I can't uh, tell you that. But there, there was a clear movement from Ukraine, a country of 40 million people who had agency who wanted to move towards the West, wanted to move toward Europe. There was a clear agitation for that from everyone, from students, from everyone for 30 years. And, and look, in 2014, they, they almost made it happen. And that's what sparked the revolution. And then since then, it's basically over for Ukraine. Now it's officially over. And as far as over, when I say it's over for Ukraine, I mean, they're never looking back as far as like big brother Russia. All right. Another thing, like Kremlin always, I'm, I'm jumping topics here now, Kremlin always deflects and projects, right? They say they want to denazify or demilitarize. <laughs> That's exactly what should be happening to them. But this is, Putin is not, you need to understand that when Putin speaks, all right, he's just trolling. He's a good troll and he learned it over 22 years. I would be a good troll as well if I had like a whole Petro state at my fingertips and if I had you know, all of these advisors basically just watching Western press, running the internet research agency, telling me the things that Donald Trump supporters might want to hear or some, you know, anti-Obama uh, faction might want to hear. That, that's all that he's doing. He's just putting this stuff out to the West all the time, every day. This is little statements. And that's, that's just what, that's, that's what they are doing. They are just trolling the West to say like, yeah, we're a really level-headed, normal society too. I haven't stolen all the wealth in my country. Russia is the third largest export of oil in the world. Do you know how much of GDP they represent? 3%. Third largest oil exporter in the world, 3% of global GDP. It's an absolute banana republic. Absolutely. All right, so all these things, look, it's corruption. All I can say is the reason that Ukraine uh, blew up in the... Uh, in, so you, after this Maidan revolution, Ukraine uh, had these two Donetsk and Lugansk uh, people's republics, all right? The only reason that they signed over was because of the FSB, all right? It wasn't Russian, uh, it wasn't Russian peacekeepers coming in. These were FSB agents. Uh, this guy, Igor Gherkin, absolute scumbag. He cut out the stomach of one of the local uh, councilmen's uh, stomach in, in like the, in 2014. The, everything was at gunpoint, all right? And that, and that includes Crimea as well. Crimea was at gunpoint, Lugansk, 
Donetsk was all at gunpoint in 2014 by the FSB. And they shot down MH, MH17 months later in July of 2014. We just forgot about that as the West. We, we forgot about it. The Dutch were pissed. But the Dutch, you know, as they do, they just kind of went on <laughs> stiff upper lip and like they just. Well, well I think, um, what's his name? Elliot. Um, the guy they do the research. From Bellingcat. Yeah, Bellingcat. Elliot, Elliot Higgins. Higgins. Yeah, Elliot oh, Higgins. Yeah, no. I mean, they, I mean, they did the work. They did the work on MH17. I mean, it, yeah, it's been proven. It's yeah. like the 53rd Regiment, I think is the number, uh, just across the border, um, brought that book in, that service to air missile uh, that took down the plane. Igor Gherkin was in charge of that as well as an FSB agent. Yeah. He's an absolute scumbag imperialist. Um, there's so many of them. They were all agitated and doing all this stuff. And look where it got them. Look, look where it got them to be closer to Mother Russia, to be closer to the security. It's what just- What do you think is driving it all though? Like, what, why? Like, I think a lot of people want to know why. Do you just not care? You just don't give a fuck? Just, he is a gangster, fuck him. No, I think he wants blacks, he, it's resources. Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. They have huge oil and gas resources. Even more have been discovered uh, since the initial invasion, my understanding. Why does he Even want more, more resources though? Because he's a corrupt criminal <laughs> and he just takes them all. As, as Bill, Bill Browder says, uh, who is probably the Western of the Vladimir Putin hates the most. And because Vladimir Putin usually speaks in this KGB speak, like I said, he never says the name of the people that he opposed him, like Navalny, he never says the name, says and calls him the German patient. He doesn't think that Americans can pick up on that. So he, <laughs> he actually said, this private US citizen, he used to be a hedge fund manager in Russia. He started this thing called the Magnitsky Act, which was taking away visas and uh, it was freezing orders on oligarchs and stuff, which was their Achilles heel. Because again, they just steal this stuff and they say they hate Europe. They hate, they hate woke culture in Europe. But where do all the oligarchs go in the summer or the winter? They're in Cannes, they're in Antibes, yeah. they're yeah. in Nice, all the rest. So again, we're, we're on a lot of different topics here now, but um, how do I want to, I, I thought I could wrap this up. Oh no, what does he want? He, he obviously wants to go all through the northern coast of the Black Sea. He took Crimea, we didn't do anything. It's their land, it's Crimea. I'm talking about Crimea as well in a sec. He took all of their land all the way on the north part of the Black Sea. He wants to take Moldova, which doesn't have any Black Sea coast, but he wants to take that and, and then it, move on. Is it for the ports? Is, is it like strategic? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Crimea is a historical freeport. Um, and another thing, like this was another thing, Scott, unfortunately, center in your show is like, you know, there was only five people that like this just enraging foe effect care that he was putting towards the people of Crimea. He was like, you know what? Five people died. I'm really sad for those five people that died, but it, that's all that happened. It was a very successful takeover of Crimea. It's not their land. It's not their land. It's the Ukrainians land. The Russians took it. Again, the only Canadian U.S. example that makes sense that Scott Horton should say is if the United States tried to go and take Canada. We're not going to do that. You can talk all you want about the empire that you hate or the deep state or the CIA or whatever. It's not their land. They have some agency. Okay, so Crimea. Russia has about 130 years of czarist rule over Crimea, all right? But before that, it was ruled by the Ottomans for 600 years. 600 years. And after the czars, it was uh, an autonomous region of the Soviet Union for the first half of the Soviet Union before World War II. After World War II, then it was part of Ukraine. Okay, so you break up the Bolshevik, you break up the you, independent Ukraine. The only time that Russia owned Crimea or had any claim on Crimea was, was about 130 years. It was like uh, late 1700s to start of the 20th century, 130 years. And just to say that that's okay, that they can take it because at those times, uh, that's, that was like the claim of the Russian empire. You gotta, you gotta, again, push on that veneer. There were Jews there, there were Genoans there. It was a free port. I mean, and regardless, it's not, it was not Russia's at the time. It was Ukraine's. Russia, as well as Germany, as well as everybody signed agreements at the dissolution of the Soviet Union. We gave, by the way, Russia signed an agreement that, the, and Germany signed an agreement, they gave up Kaliningrad, all right? So again, Scott Orton wants to think that there's like some statute of limitations, but it only goes back to the people that try to prove his point, like Tsarist Russia, all right? Tsarist Russia had, the, again, the pale of settlement, the most anti-Semitic 
uh, group of people in Europe was under czarist Russia. And you, like that you're trying to make all of these examples to prove your point about the most despicable people of any part of Europe. All right. And when in reality, let's talk about the statute of limitations. Lithuania and Poland had the biggest state in Europe for 500 years. All right. Latvia and Estonia did not. They were more like tribal states. They were more, I don't know, they were, they were tribes that were kind of under more of the German empire most of the time. But Lithuania absolutely was not. Lithuania had the biggest state for 300 years in Europe from about uh, 1300 to 1600. And then from 1600 to 1800, uh, it was Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was the biggest state in Europe before or since other than the European Union. So what, what do you want to talk about like a statute of limitations? That's, that, those are the people that were governing Ukraine. And by the way, when you talk about like who's governing at that time, like it was just to pay your taxes. It's not like Putin was running, or not Putin, uh, like the czar, sorry, Putin and czar, I'm confused a lot, but it's not like the Easy czar done. was running around, you know, and like just mutilating people and doing things that uh, we've started to do in the 20th century. People could do their business. Uh, people, you know, it was a very, this, the czarist sort of idea is a very like, it's not like there's some, it was a light touch, let's say, okay? But regardless, Tsarist Russia gave you the Pale of Settlement. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, if you want to go there, was much older, had more of a dominance of Ukraine than Russia ever did, and they were free. The Jews were free there. The Catholics were free there. This was Lviv, Lemberg in Germany. This is all of, and Kiev as well. All of that was for 500 years, 500 years, part of the Polish-Lithuanian the Lithuanian Grand Duchy, then the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And Scott Horton thinks that we need to focus on 130 years of Tsarist Russia.